Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, Paul welcomes back Shifu Jonathan Bluestein. Shifu Bluestein is an eclectic scholar and teacher from Israel. He is a graduate of Reichman University with degrees in law and government studies and a student of traditional Chinese medicine at Reedman College. A lover of the martial arts since the age of 16, he is a practitioner and teacher of several styles through his martial arts organization, Blue Jade Martial Arts International. His diverse life experiences have led Shifu Bluestein down an interesting path of self-discovery and also to the writing and publishing of eight books, including Research of Martial Arts, The Martial Arts Teacher, and Exceptional Ideas About Humanity. Most of all, however, Jonathan is a seeker of truth who is hoping to complete the mission handed over to him by his soul and perhaps by other powers to be in this lifetime. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast. Your opinions matter and your ratings help us to grow and help more people to be healthy, find freedom of body and mind and to live their dreams. Today's episode is a little different from Paul's other podcasts as he and Jonathan explore Jonathan's wisdom stories. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, I am super excited to have my buddy Jonathan Bluestein back to share more of his deep wisdom. The topic of our show today is wisdom stories. Jonathan, welcome back. Hey, I'm so happy and thrilled to be here again and to be speaking with you, Paul. And we've got quite an unusual theme today. Yeah, I'm excited about it. Uh, You know, what what, uh, Jonathan and I worked out together is we're going to share stories. Jonathan's going to read you these stories and we'll talk a little bit about them, what we each uh, pick up from them and why they're relevant to the world transition we're all going through. And uh, Jonathan forwarded me the stories. I read them. Um, uh, one of them I was familiar with, Cook Ding's Knife. Are, are you familiar with that being in the second book of the Tao by Stephen Mitchell? Yeah, the name makes sense. It rings a bell. Originally in Chinese, it appears in the book of Zhuangzi, uh, named after the other Zhuangzi, which is essentially the second book of the Tao. Yeah, yeah, I really love, I've listened to the second book of the Tao by Stephen Mitchell, you know, I don't know, maybe five or six times, just because it's one of those things you, you kind of keep needing to hear again and again to kind of drive it deep into the soul, you know. Uh, so I think all the stories are good. So just so you guys know, the stories are titled What We Still Have Left Over, Days of Pandemic, The Bet, and Cook Ding's Knife. So Jonathan will read us these stories, which I recommend you really be with. Jonathan chose these stories because they're all relevant in multiple ways to what we're all working through personally and collectively. And Jonathan's very skilled at storytelling and has uh, several fantastic books. Jonathan, why don't you just mention right up front, what are the titles of your current books out there? Well, there are several of them uh, on different topics. There is The Martial Arts Teacher, as well as Research of Martial Arts. Martial Arts Teacher, second edition, Research of Martial Arts, are of course focused on the practice of martial arts, in particular traditional martial arts of all types and kinds. Um, Research of martial arts is an investigation of how martial arts really work, but in terms that the layperson could fathom and understand, not getting into the typical nitty gritty with you know the, the hardcore physics and such, rather in a language that is uh, proper and simple and comprehensible to all of us from different styles. The martial arts teacher is perhaps the most extensive book ever written in the English language on martial arts instruction. Again, in the traditional arts, it is a how-to guide for martial arts professionals. In addition to these works, I have Prosperism, which is a thesis uh, on... uh, socioeconomics. Prosperism is the idea that we could have a more benevolent form of capitalism, a type of capitalism which is seldom if ever discussed, and brings forth a lot of uh, novel and interesting ideas about how society could be corrected 
and how it could be manifested truly and practically. I love that book. I, I've, I read that one cover to cover and, and shared it with a bunch of people and got a lot of great feedback, including people like J.P. Sears, Mickey Willis, Zeus Yamianis, and others. So every one of them gave positive feedback. But I think most of us know, and you do too, that transitioning into a system like that would take some time and it would take a uh, collective vision, I think. Um, but when I read it, I really thought it was one of the most viable solutions I've ever studied. So I'm very grateful that you shared that one with me. Um, tell us about your other books too, because uh, what, the one about the, the the greatness of humanity, I forgot the title of that one. Exceptional Ideas About Humanity. Yeah, I, that one I've read several sections of. It's very good too. Why don't you tell us about that one? Exceptional Ideas About Humanity is a compendium of standalone articles, which nonetheless intermingle and converse with another throughout the book on a very wide array of topics, ranging from uh, psychology to feng shui, architecture, law, philosophy, taxation, history, you name it. And I bring a lot of interesting themes and ideas together that are seldom uh, discussed in uh, in popular culture. Uh, for example, how does you, the architecture of where you live affect your consciousness? The architecture of your home, whether it be an, a house or an apartment, and how does that relate to our economic system? In, in your case, in my case, that would be capitalism. What is taxation really? Why are we being taxed and how is taxation related to the structure of society? How are we all affected by um, a ruling class of bureaucrats, for instance, which is unnamed and governs the world via rules which we are not taught, but nonetheless exist? And a myriad of other things like that, exploring all sorts of um, exceptional ideas about humanity, as in the title of the book and looking at them from really novel points of view. And as a matter of fact, one of the stories we would be reading today called Days of Pandemic is to be found in that particular book. It is from it. Oh, great. I didn't realize it was in there. I thought you'd written it before then, but uh, I, I find that book fascinating. I've read, as I said, several sections, and it's extremely well written, and there's a lot of very good points made in there and things to really make you ponder <laughs> a lot about life and you've got more i know i've got like five of your books in the library so <laughs> what are the rest of them oh well, there, there are quite a few of them but i'd rather get to to our today's stories but if you'd like to uh, read more about uh, my books and look into them then uh go and search uh, jeff bezos's pirate ship is enormous pirate ship called amazon and my <laughs> books are <laughs> <laughs> pirate ship yeah <laughs> well at he, least the, he, the pirate stole your books that's good well uh he does look like a bulky pirate nowadays eh start looking after himself oh, i haven't seen him i i, I haven't he's noticed, got but... there's their memes about it he's got personal trainers now so he's all buff oh is that right well good maybe he's getting ready for his next pirate run <laughs> yeah. he'd probably get johnny depp to go with him <laughs> Just needs a wooden leg now, eh? And a yeah. parrot on his shoulder. So, cool. and a should be an Amazon parrot. Yes. <laughs> so anyway, uh, un unfortunately, uh, that is a platform that um, many authors such as myself are sort of coerced to work with, to exist, uh, to exist financially and for people to know of us. So you go on Amazon.com, Amazon.co.uk, Amazon.de, wherever you are, and you write my name, Jonathan Bluestein, and you get to all of my books. And they're also all listed on my website, which is bluejadesociety.com. Blue is the color blue. Jade like the gemstone jade. Society like a society. Bluejadesociety.com. Awesome. So are we going to start with uh, what we still have to offer? Is that you're going to do them in the order that you gave them to me? Yes, certainly. Um, well, th this particular story is very touching to me personally, and I'm sure also to Paul. And he's told by uh, Chief Dan George, 
uh, who is a Native American, and he tells a story of a passing, one could call it, a passing from one era to another and from the death of one thing to the birth of another. And in the times in which we live today, we are also in transition. We are also in a time of a great passing. And I find that uh, Chief Dan George, with this particular story, conveys a message about this type of uh, historical period that is very relevant to us and which we could learn quite a bit from. So uh, without further ado, uh, I would read the story. What We Still Have Left to Offer by Chief Dan George. I am a native North American. In the course of my life, I have lived in two distinct cultures. I was born into a culture that lived in communal houses. My grandfather's house was 80 feet long. It was called a smokehouse, and it stood down by the beach along the inlet. All my grandfather's sons and their families lived in this large dwelling. Their sleeping apartments were separated by blankets made out of bulrush reeds, but one open fire in the middle served the cooking needs for all. In houses like these, throughout our tribe, people learned to live with one another. They learned to serve one another, and they learned to respect the rights of one another. Our children shared the thoughts of the adult world and found themselves surrounded by aunts and uncles and cousins who loved them. My father was born in such a house and learned from infancy how to love people and be at home with them. And beyond this acceptance of one another, there was a deep respect for everything in nature that surrounded them. My father really loved the earth and all its creatures. The earth was his second mother. The earth and everything it contained was a gift from Sisi Am. And the way to think this great spirit was to use his gifts with respect. I remember as a little boy fishing with him up Indian Arm. And I can still see him as the sun rose above the mountaintop in the morning. I can see him standing by the water's edge with his arms raised above his head while he softly cried, Thank you. Thank you. It left a deep impression on my young mind. And I shall never forget his disappointment when once he caught me gaffing for fish just for the fun of it. My son, he said, the great spirit gave you those fish to be your brothers, to feed you when you are hungry. You must respect them. You must not kill them just for the fun of it. This, then, was the culture I was born into. And for some years, the only one I really knew or tasted. This is why I find it hard to accept many of the new things I see around me. I see people living in smoke houses hundreds of times bigger than the one I knew. But these people in one apartment do not even know the people in the next and care less about them. It is also difficult for me to understand the deep hate that exists among people. It is hard to understand the culture that justifies the killing of millions in the past wars and is, at the very moment, preparing to drop bombs to kill even greater numbers. It is hard for me to understand a culture that spends more on wars and weapons to kill than it does on education and welfare to help and develop jobs for mankind. It is hard for me to understand how men not only hate and fight their brothers, but even attack nature and abuse her. I see my white brother going about blotting out nature from his cities. I see him strip the hills bare, 
leaving ugly wounds on the face of mountains. I see him tearing things from the bosom of Mother Earth as though she were a monster who refused to share her treasures with him. I see him throw poisons in her waters, indifferently to the life he kills, and he chokes the air with deadly fumes. I know that my white brother does many things well, but I wonder if he has ever really learned how to love. Perhaps he loves the things that are his own, but has never learned to love the things outside and beyond him. This is not love at all. For the man must love all creation, or he will love none of it. It is the power of love that makes him the greatest of them all. For he alone of all animals is capable of love. My friends, how desperately do we need to be loved and to love? When Christ said that man does not live by bread alone, he spoke of a hunger. This hunger was not the hunger of the body. It was not the hunger for bread. He spoke of a hunger that begins in the very depths of man, a hunger for love. Love is something you and I must have. We must have it because our spirit feeds upon it. We must have it because without it, we become weak. Without love, our self-esteem weakens. Without it, our courage fails. Without love, we can no longer look out confidently at the world. Instead, we turn inwardly and begin to feed upon our own personalities, and little by little, we destroy ourselves. You and I need the strength and joy that comes from knowing that we are loved. With it, we are creative. With it, we march tirelessly. With it, and it alone, we are able to sacrifice for others. There have been many times when we all wanted so desperately to feel a reassuring hand upon us. There have been lonely times when we wanted strong arm around us. I cannot tell you how deeply I miss my wife's presence when I return home from a trip. Her love was my greatest joy, my strength, my greatest blessing. I am afraid my culture has little to offer yours, but my culture did praise friendship and companionship. It did not look on privacy as a thing to be clung to, for privacy builds up walls and walls promote distrust. My culture lived in big family communities. And from infancy, people learn to live with others. My culture did not prize the hoarding of private possessions. In fact, to hoard was a shameful thing among my people. The Indian looked on all things in nature as belonging to him, and he expected to share them with others and take only what he needed. Everyone likes to give as well as receive. No one wishes only to receive all the time. We have taken much from your culture. I wish you had taken something from ours, for there are some beautiful and good things in it. Soon it will be too late to know my culture, for integration is upon us, and soon we will have no values but yours. Already, so many of our young people have forgotten the old ways. And many have been ashamed of their Indian ways by scorn and derision. My culture is like a wounded stag that has crawled away into the forest to bleed and die alone. The only thing that can truly help us is genuine love. You must truly love us, be patient with us, and share with us. And we must love you with a genuine love that forgives and forgets. A love that forgives the terrible sufferings your culture brought ours when it swept over us like a wave crashing along a beach. With love that forgets and lifts up its head and sees in your eyes an answering look of trust and understanding. 
Hi, everybody. Have you ever wanted to make a real difference in the world? CEO of the Czech Institute, Gavin Jennings, and I designed the Czech Academy to be the most comprehensive, complete system in the world for learning the art, science, and practice of holistic health. The Czech Academy is a multidisciplinary education system that teaches you all the essential functional anatomy, physiology, and assessments you'll need to identify the root cause of people's common body and health challenges. You will learn how to perform sensory, motor, autonomic nervous system testing, and specific orthopedic tests to determine exactly what is wrong with each client and what to do about the findings and which specific medical and healthcare professionals to refer to for a comprehensive, multidisciplinary approach to healing, performance enhancement, and well-being. You will learn how to assess a client's diet and lifestyle factors to bring anyone back to balance and educate them and their family on how to stay healthy. The Czech approach isn't a this-for-that supplement-based approach, but is based on the science of organic farming principles and whole food nutrition, which is what we need in the world now more than ever. You will learn how to use work in exercises to calm the mind and cultivate life force energy. These practices are simple enough that anyone can do them and they support your immune system, calm and clear your mind, and are excellent for stress management. Work in exercises also integrate the brain, heart, and organ systems, making our internal systems much more stable while greatly enhancing our ability to heal from any health challenge or injury. All Czech Academy students are guided by highly skilled, experienced instructors and mentors and learn a scientific approach to stretching, joint mobilization, postural correction, movement skills development, corrective, and high-performance exercise. All the prerequisite training for each level of your journey through the Holistic Lifestyle Coaching and Integrated Movement Science Training Levels 1 through 5 are provided. You will be part of a tribe of healthy, open-minded people from around the world that share a genuine interest in mastery and helping people look great, feel great, and live their dreams. Students and graduates of the Czech Academy are successful in their own studios, clinics, have started their own health and healing retreats, work for elite sports teams, in big corporations, in gyms, physical therapy, chiropractic, osteopathic, and medical clinics, and have served as private coaches and guides for many elite people, ranging from those in the movie, music, dance, and other industries. As you are surely aware, there has never been a better time to master holistic health, corrective and high performance exercise. People are finally waking up to the fact that they need skilled, personalized help from people with genuine mastery because so many have been unable to get healthy through standard medical approaches. The Czech Institute is now accepting applications for spring semester of the Czech Academy. Applications close on April the 15th. The Czech Institute is offering three partial scholarships for the program, one in each region, North America, South Pacific, and UK plus Europe. To learn more and apply, go to academy.checkinstitute.com. That's academy.checkinstitute.com. Everything you need to know is right there for you on the website, and our staff is happy to answer any additional questions you may have. We don't believe in being average, but we do teach excellence. Join now and make yourself invaluable. There's a lot in that one. It's uh, it's interesting because in many ways what happened to the Indians is is now the World Economic Forum doing it to us. That's quite a brilliant statement. And as a matter of fact, I've never heard it before. Well, you know, when you think about it, it's really, I mean, you'll own nothing and be happy. Uh, Get rid of the idea of soul. Get rid of the idea of God. Your programmable uh, biological robots is really what they're trying to create. Um, it's totally scientific materialism, which is atheism on steroids. And it's not an offer. It's not a discussion. It is totally being imposed upon. It's really, um, a silent war, so to speak. And, you know, when you look at the history of, of how the aboriginals got wiped out by the white men, the native American Indians, and many cultures around the world, <clears throat> you see the same thing, but now it's white people doing it to everybody. Um, and so I think, you know, if anything, for me, the lesson is, is 
what's really important. And, you know, I think the most important thing is if you don't have a clear dream or vision, and that's not a shared vision, you know, a, a, the chief of a tribe was responsible for carrying the vision and, and maintaining the values that kept people moving in the same direction so that there was harmony. But it seems to me that not only have we lost our vision as individuals as a whole, we've lost our vision as collectives, and we've lost our vision as people, and we've lost our connection to the greater vision of the earth, which is, you know, his his statements in there are very much like Chief Seattle's speech that he gave to the U.S. government when they were basically coercing them out of off their land and into reservations. And, uh, you know, one of the things that, that I think is being brought up in that story, both directly and indirectly, is, is what Jung referred to when he referred to the self with a capital S. The, the small self, little s-e-l-f, would be the individual or one's sense of self, one's potential for wholeness. But the self in union psychology is everything that supports you from your family to your friends to people that educate you to the gifts of nature uh, and the whole planet. And so to the degree that one cuts themselves off or is cut off from their family, their tribe, their society, their culture, or from the blessings of nature, then they are traumatized and isolated and ultimately leads first to psychological stress, anxiety, depression, and then death, whether it be by suicide because one cannot find meaning in life anymore, or by death due to the ramifications of destroying that which supports you. There's more I'd like to share. I, I be, don't want to. I just want to make room for you to share what you think's important in there. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, these are wise words indeed. First, I'd like to note if you just happen to have come across this podcast for the first time, or if you're new to some of the things which uh, Paul is discussing, you might not know what he was referring to when he was speaking of the World Economic Forum. Uh, switching up humans with robots and things of that ilk. And so just briefly, there is currently this organization which had existed since 1975, I think, uh, called the World Economic Forum, or WEF for short. It has its headquarters in Davos, Switzerland, conducting uh, meetings with all of the global elite uh, several times a year, but primarily during January. Uh, when I say global elite, I'm referring to meetings of the world's top political leaders, presidents, prime ministers, and people surrounding them with the world's billionaires. And they are uh, most of the members of this organization, the World Economic Forum, uh, as are the world's 1,000 most powerful companies. And this organization, the World Economic Forum, headed by a person whose name is Klaus Schwab, is currently promoting what he himself calls the Great Reset and also the fourth cultural, uh, sorry, the fourth industrial revolution. They almost said the cultural revolution. It was a Freudian slip because it is related to the Chinese cultural revolution. It is a very similar type of historical event in my view and understanding. And if you know anything about the Chinese cultural revolution, then you'd uh, understand what I mean. If not, you're welcome to go and read about it. In any case, the World Economic Forum, together with many um, international conglomerates, which are quite powerful, a lot of billionaires, a lot of politicians, are scheming to transition humanity into a new global technocratic culture. And that had been the subject of discussion in the previous uh, podcast episode which Paul and I recorded, so you're most welcome to listen to it. I bet there would be a link in the show notes. 
Uh, so now I would like to continue, and as we were discussing the story, its relevance to, to our times, in, in my view, is this. That we here see uh, a person in a most difficult type of transition. He is essentially admitting the imminent death of his culture, a culture which is quite deep and profound and has roots going back many thousands of years. And that culture had been in part destroyed and in other part assimilated by the white man's culture. He looks at this as an observer in a time when it is almost futile to fight. He and his generation have been fighting to preserve Native American culture, but he's also fully understanding that this culture would eventually entirely or nearly completely disappear. And from that most unusual historical vantage point reserved to very few generations in history, because very few generations have experienced the annihilation of their own ancestral culture in their generation. It doesn't happen every day, not even every few hundred years. And he looks at this from a very optimistic point of view and is capable despite the immense difficulties inherent to the situation. Think about this, to be able to think about this in a, in a positive light, in understanding that this is a passing, this is a transition, and something else which is good would eventually arise. And he is basically saying to his readers, let us together with the power of love make the most out of it. To me, it is reminiscent uh, to another short story, which I know by heart, it's just a few sentences long, uh, from the same book we, we mentioned earlier, the book of Zhuangzi, which could be called the second book of the Tao. It is the story of when Zhuangzi's wife passed away. So it became known that she passed away and um, a friend of his came from afar to visit and comfort him. And as he's approaching the house, he sees Zhuangzi outside uh, dancing and, and playing his hand drum. And he is angered and perplexed because how, how come this person is going about, you know, with such a festivity after his wife had passed away? And especially in ancient China, it was the custom to uh, very radically mourn and outwardly mourn. Uh, close relatives who passed away. Some people would show respect by mourning somebody whom they loved or was close to them for three years consecutively. And this person, his wife had just recently died and he's already joyful and dancing and playing music. And his friend in his anger said, you know, enough is enough. That is too much. Yeah, referring to other of Zhuangzi's antiques because he's known to be an eccentric sage. And why do you do this? How can, yeah, isn't, isn't this disrespectful towards your wife who just passed away? And Zhuangzi said, you know, when my wife passed away, I'm, I'm only human. I mourned her, of course. I was sad. But early on, it got to me and I realized that I should not be because I understand the transition of life. There are seasons, there's spring, transition into summer, transition into autumn, transition into winter. And such is also human life, transitioning between the seasons until my wife had passed and now she's in a great hole. And her life and her passing is like the passing of the seasons. And so in light of this, if I was to be saddened by my wife's death, then it would have shown that I do not understand how the Tao works, because her passing is just another passing of nature. It is the natural order of things. So I decided that instead of being said, I would celebrate it, like we celebrate the passing of the seasons. And that is how the story ends. And of course, that is very difficult for people to, to come to grips with, and especially those of us listening who have lost a loved one. And I've lost loved ones now. And I'm sure Paul have lost loved ones, and it is a, a very difficult thing for, for anybody. Nonetheless, here, here again we see a sage, 
Chief Dan George, it, at least in the context of this article, he's presenting us with a very sagely behavior and point of view, which is in looking at death and in the collective death, the death of a culture, and a great passing and a transition, he feels that we should appreciate what we have, learn from what was before, and create a better future together with the power of love. And now, as we are all facing a great transition following COVID times, then again, it makes sense that we celebrate this passing and make the most out of it rather than mourn it and be in collective state of grief, which binds us and freezes us and it does not allow us to promote humanity and advance forward in a productive manner. So that is my take on the story. Yeah, it's good. It's important. A couple of comments I wanted to make relevant to that story, because I think they're important as well, is that what we call soul, our inner sense of being, the knowing that I am, I can hear myself talk, I can feel my heart beat. But when we think of what is a soul, In order to know myself, I have to have a sense of what I believe in. I have to have a sense of meaning or a sense of self-agency. And I have to have some sense of values that distinguish me from a different soul or a different person. So when we look at what our soul is, our soul becomes all the experiences that we've had, all the people that have taught us, those that have wounded us and, and taught us through the wounding how to forgive and how to love and how to have empathy. And we couldn't be here without our body, so all the beings that we consume as food, all of which have their own souls, merge into us and become part of us. We experience ourselves differently with an empty stomach than we do while we're eating great food, than we do while we have a full stomach. And without the souls that have sacrificed either unwillingly or willingly to become part of us and live in us, we couldn't exist as we are. And the Native Americans appreciated that life supported life. They knew that if you took more than nature could regenerate, then you not only destroyed yourself, but you destroyed nature itself. And I think that's where Jeremy Lent's book, The Web of Meaning, becomes very important, and his four R's of inter the interdependency of all life, which came from a number of Native American tribes that basically joined together to try to identify what was important in order to make life itself sustainable. And so they identified the four R's of interdependency, or the interdependency of all life, which is relationship, which is based on love, responsibility, knowing that we each need to contribute, reciprocity, giving, not just taking, and redistribution so that we could share resources. And when we have a world with, depending on which estimates you read, between two and four billion that are at not only poverty levels, but seriously uh, low levels of poverty, you know, something like 2 billion people a day on this planet don't have enough money to even meet their basic survival needs a day. And then there's another 2 billion that are barely, barely getting by. And then at the same time, we've got, you know, 35 new billionaires just since the beginning of COVID. And it seems as though there's just no end to the emptiness that they are trying to fulfill with material means and at any cost. So from a Native American Indian's perspective, to look at this imbalance 
must be just like being tortured to see forests getting clear cut, oceans fished out, using our riverways and oceans as dumps for chemicals. It would be like somebody who is deep religious having to watch their own temple destroyed, as has happened many times in the past, because you would feel as though that everything that was important to you as a symbol of your connection to God was being destroyed. So I think one of the things that's important for me in that story is that we are dangerously close to to disabling nature with chemical toxicity, electromagnetic pollution, oil drilling that's unnecessary, fracking that's unnecessary, uh, using nature as a battlefield, which is unnecessary, um, poisoning the planet with billions and billions of pounds of agrochemicals that are completely unnecessary and unscientific, yet pawned off as scientific. And I think it's time that we all decide what we need together, as I've said in many podcasts, Because until we find a common dream that goes beyond race, color, creed, religion, we're not going to realize that what we all need in common, regardless of those things, is a healthy planet and the intelligent and moral use of technology, which isn't going to happen until we, the people, use the power of our numbers to make it happen. And if we don't make it happen, then we're probably going to be suffering yet another fate, which we already have. Because look at the billions of people every year that get cancer from dangerous drugs, poison foods, poison water, um, living lifestyles that have been programmed into them by people that have ill intent other than just pure profit. And he talked about the need for integration uh, and and, and that they were being integrated into our culture versus disintegration. And we're in a state of disintegration. And I think, you know, the Native Americans were integrated into nature and they had systems of relating with each other. They had their own customs. They had their own uh, concepts of marriage and their own mythologies. And so when someone begins to dismantle that, it's very much what happened during the lockdowns and COVID. And we went all we all went through this period of severe disintegration, which has damaged children. Many, many psychologists and researchers are now reporting that we've done what is considered to be irreparable damage to the children of this world due to these completely unnecessary, bogus, and falsely motivated lockdowns. And there's very many experts that say they're going to be doing it again and probably multiple times. So this means that we have to stand up. And instead of fighting with bows and arrows, we have to fight with our sovereignty and our unwillingness to do things that disintegrate humanity and lead it into more illness and more death and more wars and more destruction because every time we do that we take the planet down further into disintegration destruction and we're destroying nature so i think for for my personal observation of the story you know the question is how many times do we have to witness the stories of other cultures being destroyed and hear about their concerns of the planet's planet being destroyed and the disrespect of nature and the disrespect of each other before we finally wake up and say, there's truth to this. And we have to rise above our selfishness and our the danger of ethnocentric orientation, which is my group versus you, your group. And we, we all need to work together to take care of the planet so it can support not only us, but a growing population, or we're going to face many more terrible things, largely of which will be self-inflicted because we just sat around and waited for somebody else to fix things. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a sad story. It's an important story. 
and it's an honest story. And paradoxically, it sounds like it's the Indian story, but now we know it's our story, meaning all of us. Because not only is it something that's happening to everybody, but oftentimes the perpetrator of a crime without knowing it gets harmed as bad as the person that they've harmed. It's just, it takes them a while to realize that in their act of rape, murder, or theft, that they have diminished themselves as a human being. It's interesting you you raise that point because it is uh, a theme appearing in the next story we're going to address. Great. Paleo Valley makes some incredible superfood bars that are a lot different than what most people think of as a superfood bar. I've got Autumn Smith, the creator of their superfood bars, right here to tell you about them. Autumn, what is so unique about your awesome superfood bars? Well, our superfood bars are unique because not only do they not contain refined sugar or GMOs or any of the freaky additives that you'll find in most bars or gluten or anything, but they're just whole foods. They're low in sugar. They're made with superfoods like ginger and broccoli and acerola cherry and collagen from grass-fed and finished animals, which we all know is like a fountain of youth. And so the best part about them, though, is probably the flavor. They come in chocolate and apple cinnamon, and we have so many more delicious flavors to come, and they're easy to put in your bag to feed for you with your kids. And I hope you love them all as much as I do. All you have to do to get access is go to paleovalley.com, and you can use the code CHECK15, that's lowercase C-H-E-K, 15, and you can get 15% off. And I hope you love them. That's awesome. And just so you know, that's P-A-L-E-O valley.com. And I know you're going to love Autumn Superfood Bars. What else I noted, uh, aside from uh, Paul's important and thoughtful words, and and, uh, plead the listeners to solemnly consider what he was saying, there was a lot of depth in it, that in Chief Dan George's story, there was a strong Christian message. He was even quoting Christ. And his the, his cultural situation is akin, in my mind's eye, to a person who sits at home and a bunch of robbers come in, take everything that he has, but they are disinterested in a few cultural artifacts that are of personal importance to him, but they think are of no value. And him realizing that they have destroyed the entire house, they have perhaps even raped uh, some of the people in it, they have taken everything away from him, they've injured him, the house is already on fire, it's going to be burned to the ground. And in the midst of it all, the owner is sitting there and tells them, how about at least you take those cultural artifacts with you as well so you can benefit the rest of you after it all burns down? This is essentially <laughs> what he's saying, and which, again, is quite sagely and, and incredible and is reminiscent for me of a scene from uh, the book and the film, one of my favorite films, Le Miserable. Um, I think it's the Miserables with um, the character of Jean Valjean, so, uh, Paul, have you seen the movie or read the book? I, I believe I saw it a long time ago. It's an old movie, isn't it? There, there are a few of them. There's one that came came out a few years ago, uh, starring Hugh Jackman, which is quite exceptional. And there's an old one, might be from the 70s or 80s. I think that's the one I saw. So there is a scene in the in the film and in the book uh, with Jean Valjean, who's um, uh, a criminal on probation. Uh, after his prison service, uh, essentially trying to survive and given lodging by a priest in a church. And in in his desperation, he steals all manner of um, pure silver utensils, uh, which again, uh, you know, exemplifies how the church at the time was, I think it's 19th century, you know, they had all that wealth, which typically was not given to the poor. They're just, you know, hoarding it. And and he was he stole the silver utensils, but within less than 24 hours, he was caught by the police. 
and brought before the priest so the priest could um, tell the police that, yes, indeed, this is the culprit. And had this been the case, he would have been sent back to prison in which he was held for many, many years simply for stealing bread to feed his hungry sister. And so he was even more desperate now. And the priest looks at him and he knows he stole the silver utensils. And he, he tells the policeman, oh, this is my friend. Oh, he didn't steal anything. I gave it to him. Here are a few extra ones. Go ahead. Take them. Have a, have a nice life for yourself. And the policemen are perplexed, but because the priest uh, claims that this was a gift, even though they know he's lying, they cannot arrest Jean Valjean and they have to let him go alongside with all the silver utensils. And that is very similar to, you know, the uh, Chief Dan George situation, as I've described it, with the, the bunch of robbers coming to your house. But then what's interesting in the story is that this particular act of kindness completely transforms Jean Valjean's soul. And from then on, he becomes a very righteous person throughout his life until his death, because he could not fathom this act of kindness uh, being bestowed upon him by a stranger from whom he stole. So perhaps being uh, taking things from the position of Chief Dan George looking at things with the glass half full, perhaps this kind kind message of his for the future, attempting to convey more of the Native American culture for the, uh, the cultures of the future, uh, which is something that Paul, by the way, is heavily invested in. Uh, he and his uh, wife Angie are shamans, and they work a lot with um, Native American cultural traditions. Perhaps this kindness indeed would be of service to save at least some of our future generations. You know, uh, I have this gourd here that uh, is beautiful. Was given to me. It comes from, uh, I believe, one of the local Indian tribes. But every day, as part of my prayers, I blow smoke to it and send a message to all the natives of the world to bring forth the ancestral wisdom so that we can use the best of the native wisdom with the intelligent use of technology to use those two forces to bring humanity back into harmony with nature. Because I don't think there's any way we're ever going to turn back from the technological path that we're on. We're too far into it. And I don't think we could really solve the problems of the imbalances of nature with shovels and hoes and um, old style technology. I think we need the best of the science we have, the best of the technology we have, and the best of the native wisdom. So for me, you know, I think today is the day that all the wise ones from native cultures need to step forward and, and put an offering on the plate. And I think it's going to take the intelligent young people of the world that have the great ideas. You know, there was a time when Elon Musk developed PayPal and it was a great thing and it made him a lot of money. And then you got Steve Jobs and, and the iPhone and you got Bill Gates and uh, computers, even though he apparently stole the idea. but he stole several several pieces of software. He got rich off the uh, disk operating system, the Windows. It's all stolen one way or another. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, nothing much has changed there. <laughs> so the point I'm making, though, is I think it's going to take some of the wise elders that still have authentic memory and experience of native tradition and the simple ways and the ways of being in harmony with the tech giants and the ones in between the young intelligent ones that can see the new myth can help bring these technologies into an intimate relationship with ancient wisdom so that we can use technology, not only intelligently, but in ways that are protective of nature, not destructive in ways that are protective of and supportive of the values that we all need to live or we're not going to 
do anything but continue to just wipe ourselves out and bring on a sixth mass extinction of, of great proportion. So I think, you know, what's coming out of this is that when you read a story like that from a man that's that well developed and that honest, the question is how many more of those stories are we going to get to hear before there's nothing left? So let's get to hear them. Let's tell them. Yeah, let me have your next one. All right, let's get at it. The next one is uh, somewhat more lighthearted. It's a mixture of surrealism and dark humor uh, <laughs> pertaining to the crazy times we live in. And indeed, uh, this is a story, uh, most of which takes place on an airplane. And if you have had the dubious experience that my wife and I have had uh, at times with our cats, getting through airports in COVID times, uh, then you know how it felt and how bizarre the experience could have gotten at times. It was literally like being in some um, B-rated horror flick. Or a concentration camp that flies. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at least I'll give it to the Germans with the concentration camps. At least those bastards were serious while doing it. The Canadians were not as serious with the with the COVID mandates. Let me tell you, it says like they tell you, oh, you know, put in the mask, and then you see them basically winking to their buddies, like, nah, I don't, I, I'm not buying into this stuff. I'm just, I just said, you know, uh, because I, as I as I noted in my previous conversation with Paul, you know, Nazism and a lot of uh, fascist movements actually had an ideology behind them. It, it was a terrible ideology, but they had one. Whilst the, the whole COVID agenda is a, is a false ideology. It's just made up. It's a corporate ideology. Before you tell the story, I want to share something along those lines. You know, many of my students are in Canada and some of my, a lot of my friends, you know, I, I, my parents immigrated to Canada in 72. So I spent from 12 years old uh, till about, oh, 21 when I left and to the States and then ultimately joined the military. So many of my friends and students couldn't get to our classes, but I started getting rumors from people that had been able to drive across the border over by Detroit and then fly once they were in the United States and get to where they wanted to go. Then they would just fly back home and, and get a, someone to pick them up or rent a car or take a bus back to the other side, and they were able to navigate. So one of my a couple of my students recently came, maybe a few months ago now, came to one of our advanced training programs. And I just happened to say, how was it crossing the border? Because I've got a buddy I've been waiting to have come see me for since the whole COVID thing started. He's worried he's going to get stopped or quarantined or something. And the, the girl that was telling me the story, she said, well, you wouldn't believe it. We pulled up to the border crossing. And the uh, guy looks at our passports. And then he says, are you all vaccinated? And they, they didn't want to lie. So they said, no. He said, congratulations, neither are we. And he waved them through. <laughs> so I thought, well, there is, there's, there's angels every now and then hiding in the right places. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, the Canadian madness was mostly in the cities. People outside of the cities, I don't think it took it too seriously. Well, let's hear your great story. All right. So, again, stories takes place on an airplane, which is not as evident in the beginning. And the story is called Days of Pandemic by Jonathan Blusting. All right. It was a very calm and blue day to be experiencing a clumped streak of neuroticism in the broad skies of Canada. <laughs> Some 200 human beings were up there on that day, crammed into a metal bird flying above frozen wastelands. So rapid was their advance that the number of meters attained in a second exceeded the count of useful thoughts most of these passengers would have in a year. In this future of some history, a journey as such had become mundane, almost boring. Ordinarily, the logisticians of aerial necessities, that is, the flight attendants, would have been busy answering with fake smiles to the annoying and often obscene demands of the morally degraded. May they be richer or poorer, 
their lips being adjusted appropriately. Uh, by the way, pausing here, as uh, some listeners might know, if you've traveled uh, business or first class, you get more smiles if you pay more. That's just <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah, isn't that funny? Yes. And, and at times, if you go on an airplane um, and the flight attendant thinks that you're actually belonging business class, then she smiles at you uh, more more happily, but then changes her emotional output when she sees that you're going to that other class. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so, yet in this special time and during that most extraordinary of occasions, the clerical germs inside the gut of the giant vessel were elated for, due to the to causes they did not clearly understand, fate has bestowed upon them a noble goal, the protection of the public's health and safety. They were deemed essential workers, while others were designated as redundant. This convergence of circumstances had gifted them with white, the color of priests, and an authority over those with a spiritual inclination towards death. It was on that day that Dwight, a meritorious servant of his Sky Services company since long ago, had one of those rare, meaningful thoughts. With a sudden streak of blatant genius, inspiration, Dwight had come to realize that he was no longer a mere little screw in the greater system, distributing toxic meals and catering for petty emotions. Rather, he was now a full-time serviceable savior of mankind. Which meant, as fate would have it, that now they and them aboard would have to listen to him solemnly. Overjoyed with this revelation, Dwight went to work that day with the enthusiasm of a true zealot. Neither salary nor promotion, formerly of importance to him, seemed to now matter. For Dwight has been reborn. His old materialist mind has receded and surrendered to a higher cause, which Dwight overheard was some kind of menace, but the details matter little as long as the sheep in the hovering hall were unusually attentive and he could now wield the staff of fear to direct them at will. Armed with a silly piece of cotton to cover his human emotions, gloves in the color of royalty to avoid touching the impure, and a flimsy outfit in the spectrum most reflective of light, Dwight now felt aligned with the priests of old and undoubtedly as wise. Things were made easy for Dwight in advance. Powerful forces have fed his truth to the masses already, and it has infiltrated their bodily tissues to the utmost, causing their blood to bubble. Even those temporarily inhabiting the aviating bus who have come to think of such ideas as distasteful or unpleasant were usually too thoroughly invested in the social pretense to make a scene by acts of rebellion. For traitors as such were marked as progenitors of disease and mayhem to be shunned by their peers and even family members. All of this, much to the advantage and satisfaction of Dwight, whose rank and esteem as the keeper of order and civility was thus raised among the people. In the era of utmost alienation, the bureaucrat is king. And then let me repeat that sentence. In the era of utmost alienation, the bureaucrat is king. On the same flight with the evangelical Dwight resided Wallace, a retired senior microbiologist from a prestigious academic production line of even more prestigious characters. Wallace had made a career for himself looking at very small things, which has earned him the favor of society 
as no one else thought it interesting or meaningful to do the same. The government of some timely empire, wink wink, also very much decorated and adorned Wallace with words and symbols as his efforts were instrumental in the importation of freedom into an enemy nation by means of freeing 10% of the population of the other 90% using some of Wallace's miniature creatures. <laughs> Sadly, uh, so focused was Wallace on the things unseen by the naked eye that he had lost vision of his own gregarious mouth and inflating abdomen, earning him a diseased body. Now he was hard of breathing and stiffer still with his common sense. That Dwight could see that this fellow Wallace was sitting in his domain whilst neglecting to adorn a mask was as attractive as a golden fortune which tempts greed. Recruiting the muscles of his forehead and eyebrows to their utmost, Dwight initiated the usual litany about a sinner's fate and need for repentance. This sacred cloth must protect the front. So was the common belief in those times. But Wallace, an old bulldog of stern demeanor, neither flinched at nor indulged in Dwight's routine. Countering the young enthusiast's dogma, Wallace heretically suggests that this whole ordeal with the concealment of bodily features and distancing people from the brethren had been a careful plot, brilliantly, though viciously orchestrated by the fellows who were paying his retirement funds. Besides, Wallace added bitterly, the mask was making his already breathing uneasy and contributed to his exacerbating panic attacks. Upon hearing this, Dwight became all the more swayed by his inner fires and sought the continuation of their verbal conflict. The result of that frivolous encounter, which lasted several minutes, were soon forgotten by the witnesses. Even Dwight could not well recall that man's name the day after, as he was telling his girlfriend of that old pesky passenger whom he had definitely saved from the dangers of the raging virus. A tad more memorable was Wallace's funeral a week later, after his heart had succumbed to the final penetrating pressures of conflict, following a life of strife over trifles. He was otherwise free of disease at the time of his passing, or so the doctor said. Never has a human invention captivated the repressed terror of the masses as well as the airplane like worms in the belly of the feathered fowl or sardines in a tin can. They are asked to be the allegories of food and to occupy a celestial lair in which they have no chance to survive as individuals, bound by the mercy of hostile guardians. Throughout their journey in the clouds, all they yearn for is the quick release out the mouth of the beast into which they have been inhaled, bidding parts of their soul for destructions from the pearls of their own imagination as ignited by anonymous forces. The aircraft, indeed, is the temple of self-sacrifice, whose iconography and symbolism are by themselves sufficient to inflict dominance by fear. Hi, everybody. I'm super excited to share Bioptimizer's new excellent sleep support product called Sleep Breakthrough. I've used it and my kids use it and it's really good. It helps me sleep. It tastes great. And since it's a new product, I've got Matt here from Bioptimizer's, who's one of the co-creators of the product, to give us some more information on how and why it works so well. So Matt, how does it work so well? Yeah, first of all, Sleep Breakthrough is a drink. You mix it about an hour before your target bedtime. You're going to feel your nervous system and your brain calm down. Your sleep latency will drop. 
Your desire to fall asleep will improve. Your REM's going to improve. Your heart rate will slow down and you're going to wake up feeling awesome. The way it works is we're targeting five different pathways. The first one is we want to optimize your natural melatonin production. We do that by giving your body the building blocks that it needs. The first one is magnesium bisglycinate has been shown to naturally increase melatonin levels. Then we add cofactors like P5P, which is a bioactive form of vitamin B6. Second, we have four different sleep minerals that will all improve the quality of your night's sleep. First is potassium, helps quiet down neurons. Second, calcium, which improves REM and also helps transform tryptophan into serotonin, which is a building block for melatonin. Third is zinc, which is really important for the metabolism of melatonin against a cofactor. And it also calms down the nervous system. And then last, again, is the magnesium bisglycinate. The third pathway is GABA, which is the molecule of chill. When they looked at insomniacs, they found that insomniacs were about 30% lower in GABA than people without sleep disorders. We tested pretty much every GABA on the market. We found that pharma GABA was the most powerful. The fourth pathway is they were targeting the brain. We're targeting brain waves. There's two molecules we can use to increase alpha brain waves and decrease beta brain waves, which is when people are struggling to fall asleep, the monkey brain's active, the hamster wheel's going, is because they have too many beta brain waves going. L theanine and pharma GABA increase alpha brain waves. And the last thing is glycine. Using three grams of glycine, which helps lower body temperature, it promotes faster sleep onset, extends REM. And my favorite part about it is if there's a night where you don't get enough sleep, you'll actually wake up feeling better and more refreshed the next day. That's awesome. Sounds like you did a lot of research to put a real beautiful combination of synergistic supplements and ingredients together to really help people sleep. I know it works very well. And I know one of the things that's lovely is my kids love it because it tastes great. Mm -hmm. And we all need more sleep, especially in the buzz of the world today. So if you want to get your sleep breakthrough, go to sleepbreakthrough.com forward slash C-H-E-K in lowercase. And to get your 10% discount on your sleep breakthrough, use the code capital P, capital A, capital U, capital L, 10. That's Paul 10 on checkout. Enjoy sleeping much better with Sleep Breakthrough. Not only is it a true story, there's a few things that rose up in me that I'll share. First of all, the idea of protecting public health and providing safety in the whole pandemic is the is is a mountain of horse shit so high no mountaineer could climb it. And I can give plenty of evidence of that. If there was any genuine interest in protecting public safety, then we would make it illegal to poison food. We would not be passing laws or corporations sneaking into government and bribing legal, the legal system and manipulating it so that poisons don't have to be listed on packages. And I could go on a long discussion of that we would be putting legitimate regulations on drugs. We would not be allowed, drug companies allowed to do their own research, which is largely uncontested, which is a date with the devil. We wouldn't be investing trillions of dollars in weapons of mass destruction. We would be concerned about the lack of education in the education system. We would be protecting ourselves and each other against the money tricks being played by the bankers and big corporations and people like Bill Gates and crew. We would be protecting our water. We'd be protecting our soil from the chemical barons that are destroying the planet. We would be looking at the fact that the pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, and rodenticides that are made legal should be illegal because they're killing human beings as well as nature. We would be aware that the science has long been around to show that the germ theory is invalid and that the terrain theory is valid and that ultimately it's not the germs, it's the health and vitality of your internal biological terrain, your gut in particular, that determines how functional your immune system is. We would not have a world full of metabolic disorder, obesity, diabetes. 
and chronic diseases for which the solutions are largely diet and lifestyle. Proof of this is when the U.S. Surgeon General, once named C. Everett Koop, was brave enough to announce in a public television announcement that about 95% of all the top 10 diseases that kill people are lifestyle diseases and that if people would pay more attention to what they eat and get more exercise, these issues would be largely handled, which got him fired from his position the next day. Janet Reno, another person in Fauci's position, was concerned during the AIDS epidemic and encouraged young people to masturbate and get pleasure so they didn't get into dangerous relationships with people for which she was fired the next day, largely due to a Christian upheaval. We have diseased bodies everywhere. Even before COVID, we were at the top of the charts. We have in the United States, what was the 37th ranked medical system in the world. And according to current research from discussions I had with Zeus Yamianis, it's down to 64th in the world, but is the most expensive in the world, which means the government sitting back watching our entire medical system degrade into nothing but a complete shambles. So my question is, where's the rescue? We are the rescue. That's it. And the, <laughs> We're point, it. The, the point being the COVID thing is supposed to protect you. That's a pile of shit. And isn't it interesting that some 35 new billionaires have been made just since the beginning of COVID off of COVID related product sales? And isn't it sad that the oceans are now full of masks? damaging the ocean and the ocean waters full of plastic microparticles of which fish are breathing. Isn't it sad that there's a mountain of garbage the size of the state of Texas in the Pacific Ocean? Isn't it amazing that we now have an issue of so much disabled satellites and space junk that space itself is becoming littered with satellites that could come tumbling down at any unknown time? The point being is, Anybody that doesn't have enough common sense to see that we're in the throes of a very, very dangerous corporate-driven ploy that we all need to stand up against, that we allowed to happen by being passive and not paying attention to the obvious signs that have been shared in hundreds and hundreds of documentaries, such as um, Social Dilemma, um, What's uh, Naomi Klein's shock doctrine and many, many others, you, you know, so you know, the, I think, Jonathan, one of the issues that is, is really at front here is it, it has become humans tendency to wait for somebody else to fix the problem. But clearly nobody else is going to fix the problem. It's our problem. We funded it. We created it largely through being brainwashed and being passive, but even somebody that's brainwashed still has a body to deal with every day and still gets to see the signs in the mirror of their own choices. And our bodies are a mirror image as a collective of what we're doing to the planet. Diseased bodies, inflamed bodies, sick bodies, tired bodies. That's exactly what we're doing to the planet. So you know, what your story brought up in me is these things that people keep overlooking. And, and that's, I think it's important. You know, sometimes you have to go through challenging times and I've been through many of them and you got to go through times that give you a chance to decide what your values are. And the paradox is that the values that you're willing to live for are only legitimate if you're willing to die for them. The sad part is a lot of people are dying for values that they don't even know that are being inflicted upon them because their value system isn't established because they don't have a clear sense of dream, direction, motive, goals, or a reason to do anything but exist and try to make a paycheck to get the next iPhone or come home and drug themselves to make it to another day. And ultimately, that means we've got to really 
consciously look at what it means to be alive and what the purpose of life is. And when we lose touch with the things that are important, which are beautifully defined in the questions a real shaman is likely to ask you if you come to a shaman for help. Such questions as, when did you stop singing? When did you stop dancing? When did you stop enjoying being alone? And when did playing. You lose? Yes, when did you stop losing your sense of the magic, mystery, and awe for life? The answers to those questions tell a person like me as a therapist exactly where I need to look into the events of your life to see where you became wounded to the point that you're now either a victim, a prostitute, a saboteur, or somebody in need of legitimate help. And so I think if we look at those questions, it would suggest that we need to sing more together, that we need to dance more together, that we need to enjoy being alone to get to know who we really are, what we want, and what values will support it. We need to really seriously ponder the magic and the mystery and the awe of life and what it takes to keep a hundred trillion cells, each of which is made of a hundred trillion atoms, singing and dancing in harmony so that we can look in the mirror and say, I am. You know, I, I think that as strange as it is, this whole pandemic is is sadly exactly what we need to give us enough of an awakening to start deciding whether we're going to continue to be the children of people that have nothing but profit in mind, or we're going to step into our adulthood and defend the Native American Indian or the Native of any land in ourselves before we, too, find ourselves in square buildings living the existence of a laboratory animal. Mm -hmm. So you just finished uh, raising the uh, the topic of architecture, uh, which is also something I mentioned earlier, referring to my book "Exceptional Ideas About Humanity." Yes. How architecture affects society, and I had a very interesting type of insight many years ago when I first traveled to China in 2012, and I lived in the city of Tianjin, which is an enormous city at the time. It was 15 million people. I believe by now it should be 16, 17 million people. Um, it's at the vast, it is, it is at the scope, uh, culturally, uh, trade-wise, etc., of something like New York City, even though they say Shanghai is the New York City of China, but Tianjin is also a, a vast center of commerce. And in the city of Tianjin, as soon as I arrived there, I noticed something very strange, and which was interesting to me, quite different to what I was used to uh, living all my life in Israel, even though I traveled the world. Everything was enormous. The streets were very wide. Uh, in Israel, it, on, the, on the largest highways, you might have six lanes. Typically on a highway, you would have four. And in, in China, in Tianjin, even in the middle of the city, you could have a highway of 12 lanes. And it was not unusual. With, uh, you, you could even have a sidewalk of people crossing by foot 12 lanes. And wow. the buildings were enormous and the distances between places and buildings. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party is invested in large art. So you'd be in the subway and you'd see um, an enormous piece of wood. Um, a tree maybe, I don't know, um, 70 foot tall, which was um, torn down, placed sideways. And then a whole village was cut. A village scene was carved into that tree and they put that whole tree laying sideways um, as a, a cultural ornament at the subway. Uh, things like that were all over the place. It's quite impressive. Culture is, is very evident in China and all over the place. Every tree in the city was shaped like a bonsai tree. Every single one. Uh, so that when you have authoritarianism, and it's quite radical, you can also achieve some uh, miraculous things with culture which are difficult to achieve otherwise. These are some of the minor benefits of Chinese authoritarianism, which is mostly negative. And then um, it also occurred to me that when you walk the streets of a city like Tianjin or Beijing or Shanghai, you feel like a tiny ant. You feel 
unimportant because of the vastness of it all and the amount of people, like a tiny ant in an, in an ant's nest of billions of people. And that affects your psychology. And that is architecture and city planning affecting your psychology. And this is why, by the way, and this would be a controversial argument that you see Israelis all over the place. How come that Israel, a state the size of New Jersey with only 9 million people, is so well known across the world? Put aside the, the, the religious and the historical facets of it for a moment. It doesn't make sense that Israelis are literally everywhere in the business and, and culture and sports and politics. Why is it so? And I would say one of the reasons is, amongst many, and I've written a book about this, by the way. It's amongst my books, if you'd like to look. Um, one of the reasons is that Israel is such a tightly knit community, with most people being Jews and are essentially all close or distant relatives of one another, and they know this. So you get the sense of, hey, I can accomplish something. Because we're physically tightly together. The streets are, tend to be tiny. The Everybody are bound together. And that affects the collective psychology and the sociology of it all. So, yeah, as, as you've noted, Paul, um, architecture makes a difference, which is why the globalists, the, the elites of today, would like to manufacture a new society, would like to uh, cram everybody together in mega cities. Because that creates a society in, in which it is far more difficult for people to take initiative because psychologically you feel like a tiny ant. And if you grew up like this, for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, it is very difficult to see how you can make a difference. But indeed, we are the solution. And that feeling of being a tiny ant is merely an illusion by the scope and scale of the things around us. It doesn't make it true. Now, as for the story itself, for me, in part, it's a story about karma because we see the character of Wallace, the microbiologist, who's worked for governments, um, doing very uh, shady, horrendous things, uh, causing the death of probably many millions of people. And he has karma coming to bite him in the ass because that same type of system, which manufactures death and panic, eventually collapses the last um, um, the last remnants of strength that he had in his heart and he dies of a heart attack because his life was too stressed first by, due to his cooperation with such forces and secondly because the whole situation brought about by the worship of the, the virus narrative was too much for him. And so we arrive at, at this surreal situation wherein you have people like Dwight, the flight attendant, who is completely oblivious to what is going on, but feels empowered by it. And because he suddenly, his life suddenly has meaning, he bullies people. And then he ends up bullying the very type of person due to whom situations as such were created to begin with. So this is almost like... A, like a karmic paradox. The, the snake that eats its own tail, so to speak, between that flight attendant and the microbiologist. And that is the gist of it. Yeah, before we move on, I'd like to let everybody know there's a fantastic episode on the series titled Sacred Geometry by Robert J. Gilbert on Gaia TV. Um, it might be episode four, but it features the work of Ibrahim Karim, the founder of Biogeometry, who I have two podcasts with. The, my 200th episode was with uh, Ibrahim on his new book. And uh, there's another episode with Doria Karim on Biogeometry. But in that episode with Robert J. Gilbert, there's a lot of great information and research showing how doing things like changing the shape of a classroom and many other such things has huge effects on children with learning disorders, autism, and how using shape, Ibrahim uh, Karim could accelerate the growth of plants, get rid of parasites, all completely safe, non-toxic methods, and much more. And Ibrahim Karim is an architect by training, and uh, there's just a tremendous amount of information in that uh, presentation 
on Robert J. Gilbert's show on sacred geometry, as well as in Ibrahim's teachings about the effect of buildings, shape, and architecture on our health and well-being. It's, it's a very well-established science that very few people are aware of. Well, here again, repeats the theme, the uh, influence of architecture and ge geometry on energy and society, right? Yes, that's my point. Mm -hmm. And by the way, this has a name in traditional Chinese culture. This is called feng shui. Feng yes. shui li literally wind and water. Because the, the first things the Chinese people have noticed affected human beings and the environment were the wind and the water. This is why they call the science of researching how the environment and the architecture affect uh, human society and individuals is called feng shui, wind and water. Yes. I've studied feng shui enough to understand it. I'm not a practitioner of it, but I, I certainly understand the principles and it is very as you say, in line with biogeometry. And um, I've encouraged a number of my patients over the years with serious health challenges to have experts in feng shui come work with their homes and their offices. In every single case, they all notice significant improvements. And I think it's a real science that people would benefit from. Hi, everybody. One of my favorite Symbiotica products, which I'd love to use when you got two kids in the house that bring home all sorts of stuff from school and have runny noses and coughs like kids often do. So if I need a little backup, I get out my Symbiotica liposomal vitamin C. Tastes great. Feels great. I use it regularly. And it's just a good backup plan to support your immune system. But better yet, I've got Shervine, the creator of the product, right here to tell us more about it. So Shervine, what's unique about your liposomal vitamin C? Well, this has evolved over the years. This is our ninth iteration. And this is coming from fermented cassava, mm. not coming from corn. And it's in liposomal form. And we also have added compounds in there, including biotin and potassium bicarbonate, which is a very highly absorbing form of potassium. This right here is delicious. It is delicious. Okay? You know, we're using organic vanilla and organic extracts and citrus bioflavonoids, and you're getting a thousand milligrams of fermented vitamin C in liposomal form. So we're talking about pure absorption. So if you're, you know, you got the everyday cold or you're feeling the chills or you just need a boost in your immune system, boom, you can hit that right there. It's good for children. It's good for, you know, elderly. Anyone can have it. And it is one of my favorite products. Or if you're going to go on an airplane or being around a lot of people that aren't healthy and you just want a little immune backup or immune boost. Absolutely. That's delicious, mm. high absorbing, and gets to the subcellular level almost immediately. And kids love it. Kids love it. I haven't met anyone that doesn't like the flavor. It's beautiful. Yeah. So to get your Living 4D discount, go to symbiotica.com. That's C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A.com. To get your 15% discount on checkout, use the code capital L, number four, capital D, 15. Enjoy your Symbiotica liposomal vitamin C. Okay, Jonathan, this story, uh, the bet, I found this quite meaningful and deep. It's a, it's a very interesting story. It's certainly one <laughs> that opens up a lot of thinking on a lot of levels. Mm -hmm. It was uh, quite interesting at the end. I was wondering, you know, what was really going on there? You know, it was almost like a, <laughs> like a mystery, you know? And so uh, I was curious as to how it was going to end. So I think it'll be interesting for the listeners to try to figure it out too. You know, obviously at the end does tell you what's going on. It is quite incredible, and the, the story is so good that I've read it over 10 times over the years and have taught it to all of my students. You know, what it reminded me of is your story of the whole, because it had some parallels to the whole. Hmm. I, I, w I was not actually consciously aware of it. <laughs> well, you know, the, the reason it did is because the whole was all about wealth and, and, um, and values, right? And this, this thing's... Ultimately, it's based on wealth and what's ultimately meaning, isn't it? It is. It's interesting. The whole is a story you read on the previous podcast episode, uh, which we did together. And I think, yes, the whole looks on, examines similar themes to, to this story, the bet, 
just on a grand social level, and this one is very personal. It's personal, but it's also archetypal. <laughs> it's true. Yes. So let's get let's get digging into yeah, it. Yeah, go. It's, it's let's brilliant. hear it. The Bet by Anton Chekhov. It was a dark autumn night. The old banker was walking up and down his study room, remembering how, 15 years before, he had given a party one autumn evening. There had been many clever men there, and there had been interesting conversations. Among other things, they had talked of capital punishment. The majority of guests among whom were many journalists and intellectual men, disapproved of the death penalty. They considered that form of punishment out of date, immoral, and unsuitable for Christian states. In the opinion of some of them, the death penalty ought to be replaced everywhere by imprisonment for life. I don't agree with you, said their host, the banker. I have not tried either the death penalty or imprisonment for life, but uh, if one may judge a priori, the death penalty is more moral and more humane than imprisonment for life. Capital punishment kills a man at once, but lifelong imprisonment kills him slowly. Which executioner is the more humane? He who kills you in a few minutes? or he who drags the life out of you in the course of many years. Both are equally immoral, observed one of the guests, for they both have the same object, to take away life. The state is not God. It has not the right to take away what it cannot restore when it wants to. Among the guests was a lawyer, a young man of five and twenty. When he was asked his opinion, The young lawyer said, The death sentence and the life sentence are equally immoral. But if I had to choose between the death penalty and imprisonment for life, I would certainly choose the second. To live anyhow is better than not at all. A lively discussion arose. The banker, who was younger and more nervous in those days, was suddenly carried away by excitement. He struck the table with his fist and shouted at the young man, It's not true. I'll bet you two million you wouldn't stay in solitary confinement for five years. Now, if you mean that in earnest, said the young man, I will take the bet, but I would not stay five, but fifteen years. Fifteen. Done, cried the banker. Gentlemen, I stake two million. Agreed. You stake your millions? And I stake my freedom, said the young man. And this wild, senseless bet was carried out. The banker, spoiled and frivolous, with millions beyond his reckoning, was delighted at the bet. At supper, he made fun of the young man and said, Think better of it, young man, while there is still time. To me, two million is a trifle, but... You're losing three or four of the best years of your life. I say three or four because you won't stay longer. You you don't know either, you unhappy man, that the voluntary confinement is a great deal harder to bear than compulsory. The thought that you have the right to step out at liberty at any moment will poison your whole existence in prison. I'm sorry for you. And now the banker, walking to and fro, remembered all this, and asked himself, what was the object of that bet? What is the good of that man's losing 15 years of his life and my throwing away 2 million? Can it prove that the death penalty is better or worse than imprisonment for life? Uh, No, no. It was all nonsensical and meaningless. On my part, it was Capri of a pampered man, and on his part, simple greed for money. Then he remembered what followed that evening. It was decided that the young man should spend the years of his captivity under the strictest supervision in one of the lodges in the banker's garden. It was agreed that for 15 years 
he should not be free to cross the threshold of the lodge to see human beings, to hear the human voice, or to receive letters or in the newspapers. He was allowed to have a musical instrument and books, and he was allowed to write letters, to drink wine, and to smoke. By the terms of the agreement, the only relations he could have with the outer world were by a little window made purposely for that object. He might have anything he wanted, books, music, wine, and so on, in any quantity desired by writing an order, but could only receive them through the window. The agreement provided for every detail and every trifle that would make his imprisonment strictly solitary and bound the young man to stay there exactly 15 years, beginning from 12 o'clock, November 14th, 1870, and ending at 12 o'clock of November 14th, 1885. The slightest attempt on his part to break the conditions, if only two minutes before the end, released the banker from the obligation to pay him the two million. For the first year of his confinement, as far as one could judge from his brief notes, the prisoner suffered severely from loneliness and depression. The sounds of the piano could be heard continually day and night from his lodge. He refused wine and tobacco. Wine, he wrote, excites the desires, and desires are the worst foes of the prisoner. And besides, nothing could be more dreary than drinking good wine and seeing no one. And tobacco spoiled the air of his room. In the first year, the books he sent, he sent for were principally of a light character. Ah, novels with a complicated love plot, sensational and fantastic stories, and so on. In the second year, the piano was silent in the lodge, and the prisoner asked only for the classics. In the fifth year, music was audible again, and the prisoner asked for wine. Those who watched him through the window said that all that year, he spent doing nothing but eating and drinking and lying on his bed, frequently yawning and angrily talking to himself. He did not read books. Sometimes at night, he would sit down to write. He would spend hours writing, and in the morning tear up all that he had written. More than once, he could be heard crying. In the second half of the sixth year, the prisoner began zealously studying languages, philosophy, and history. He threw himself eagerly into these studies, so much so that the banker had enough to do to get him the books he ordered. In the course of four years, some 600 volumes were procured at his request. It was during that, this period that the banker received the following letter from his prison. My dear jailer, I write to you these lines in six languages. Show them to people who know the languages. Let them read them. If they find not one mistake, I implore you to fire a shot in the garden. That shot will show me that my efforts have not been thrown away. The geniuses of all ages and of all lands speak different languages, but the same flame burns in all of them. Oh, if you only knew the unearthly happiness my soul feels now from being able to understand them. The prisoner's desire was fulfilled. The banker ordered two shots to be fired in the garden. Then after the tenth year, the prisoner sat immovably at the table and read nothing but the gospel. It seems strange to the bank that a man who in four years had mastered 600 learned volumes, should waste nearly a year over one thin book of easy comprehension. Theology and histories of religion follow the Gospels. In the last two years of his confinement, the prisoner read an immense quantity of books quite indiscriminately. At one time, he was busy with the natural sciences then he would ask for Byron or Shakespeare. There were notes in which he demanded 
at the same time, books on chemistry and a manual of medicine and a novel and some treatises on philosophy or theology. His reading suggested a man swimming in the sea among the wreckage of his ship and trying to save his life by greedily clutching first at one spar and then at another. The old banker remembered all this and thought, tomorrow at 12 o'clock, he will regain his freedom. By, I, by our arrangement, I ought to pay him two million. If I do pay him, it is all over with me. I shall be utterly ruined. Fifteen years before, you see, his millions had been beyond his reckoning. Now he was afraid to ask himself which were, he, which were greater, his debts or his assets. Desperate gambling on the stock exchange, wild speculation, and the excitability which he could not get over even in advancing years, had by degrees led to the decline of his fortune, and the proud, fearless, self-confident millionaire had become a banker of middling rank, trembling at every rise and fall in his investments. Curse a bet, muttered the old man, clutching his head in despair. Why didn't the man die? He's only 40 now. He will take my last penny for me. He will marry. He will enjoy life. Will gamble on the exchange. While I shall look at him with envy like a beggar and hear from him every day the same sentence. I am in debt to you for the happiness of my life. Let me help you. And no, it is too much. Too much. The one means of being saved from bankruptcy and disgrace is the death of that man. It struck three o'clock. The banker listened. Everyone was asleep in the house and nothing could be heard outside but the rustling of the chilled trees. Trying to make no noise, he took from the fireproof safe the key of the door which had not been opened for 15 years, put it, put on his overcoat and went out of the house. It was dark and cold in the garden. Rain was falling. A dumb, damp, cutting... Sorry. Bit. It was dark and cold in the garden. Rain was falling. A damp, cutting wind was racing about the garden, howling and giving the trees no rest. The banker strained his eyes, but could see neither the earth nor the the white statues, nor the lodge, nor the trees. Going to the spot where the lodge stood, he twice called the watchman. No answer followed. Evidently, the watchman had sought shelter from the weather and was now asleep somewhere, either in the kitchen or in the greenhouse. If I had to pluck to carry out my intention, thought the old man, Suspicion would fall first upon the watchman. He felt in the darkness for the steps and the door and went into the entry of the lodge. Then he groped his way into a little passage and lighted a match. There was not a soul there. There was a bedside with no bedding on it, and in the corner there was a dark cast iron stove. The seals on the door leading to the prisoner's rooms were intact. When the match went out, the old man, trembling with emotion, peeped through the little window. A candle was burning dimly in the prisoner's room. He was sitting at the table. Nothing could be seen but his back, the hair on his head, and his hands. Open books were lying on the table, on the two easy chairs, and on the carpet near the table. Five minutes passed, and the prisoner did not once stir. Fifteen years' imprisonment had taught him to sit still. The banker tapped on the window with his fingers, and the prisoner made no movement whatever in response. Then the banker cautiously broke the seals off the door, and put the key in the keyhole. The rusty lock gave him 
grating sound and the door creaked. The banker expected to hear at once footsteps and a cry of astonishment. But three minutes passed and it was as quiet as ever in the room. He made up his mind to go in. At the table was a man unlike ordinary people, who was sitting motionless. He was a skeleton with a skin drawn tight over his bones, with long curls like a woman's and a shaggy beard. His face was yellow with an earthly tint in it. His cheeks were hollow, his back long and narrow, and the hand on which his shaggy head was propped was so thin, delicate, it was dreadful to look at. His hair was already streaked with silver, and seeing his emaciated, aged-looking face, no one would have believed that he was only 40. He was asleep. In front of his bowed head, there lay on the table a sheet of paper on which there was something written in fine handwriting. Poor creature, thought the banker. He is asleep and most likely dreaming of the millions. And I have only to take this half-dead man, throw him on the bed, stifle him a little with the pillow, and the most conscientious expert would find no sign of a violent death. Uh, but let us first read what he has written here. The banker took the page from the table, and it read as follows. Tomorrow, at 12 o'clock, I regain my freedom and the right to associate with other men. But before I leave this room and see the sunshine, I think it necessary to say a few words to you. With a clear conscience, I tell you, as before God, who beholds me, that I despise freedom and life and health and all that your books is called it all in your books is called good things of the world. For fifteen years I've been intently studying earthly life. It is true I have not seen the earth nor man, but in your books I have drunk fragrant wine, I have sung songs. I have hunted stags and wild boars in the forests. I have loved women, beauties as ethereal as clouds created by the magic of your poets and geniuses, have visited me at night and have whispered in my ears wonderful tales that have set my brain in a whirl. In your books I have climbed to the peaks of El Boz and Mont Blanc, and from there I have seen the sunrise, and I have watched it at evening, flood the sky, the ocean, and the mountaintops with gold and crimson. I have watched from there the lightning flashing over my head and cleaving the storm clouds. I have seen green forests, fields, rivers, lakes, towns. I have heard the singing of sirens and the strains of the shepherd's pipes. I have touched the wings of comely devils who flew down to converse with me of God. In your books, I have flung myself into the bottomless pit before miracles, slain, burned towns, preached new religions, conquered whole kingdoms. Your books have given me wisdom. All that the unresting thought of man has created in the ages is compressed into a small compass in my brain. I know that I am wiser than all of you. And I despise your books. I despise wisdom and the blessings of this world. It is all worthless, fleeting, illusory, and deceptive like a mirage. You may be proud, wise, and fine, but death will wipe you off the face of the earth as though you were no more than mice sparring under the floor. And your posterity, your history, your immortal geniuses will burn or freeze together with the earthly globe. You have lost your reason and taken the wrong path. You have taken lies for truth and hideousness for beauty. You would marvel if, owing to strange events of some sorts, frogs and lizards suddenly grew on apple and orange trees instead of fruit, or if roses began to smell like a sweating horse. So, 
I marvel at you who exchange heaven for earth. I don't want to understand you. To prove to you, in action, how I despise all that you live by, I renounce the two million of which I once dreamed of as a paradise and which now I despise. To deprive myself of the right to the money, I shall go out of here five hours before the time fixed and so break the compact. When the banker had read this, he laid the page on the table, kissed the strange man on his head, and went out of the lodge, weeping. At no other time, even when he had lost heavily on the stock exchange, had he felt so great a contempt for himself. When he got home, he lay on his bed, but his tears and emotions kept him for hours from sleeping. Next morning, the watchmen ran with, a pale face, with pale faces and told him they had seen the man who lived in the lodge climb out of the window into the garden, go to the gate, and disappear. The banker went at once with the servants to the lodge and made sure of the flight of his prison. To avoid arousing unnecessary talk, he took from the table the writing in which the millions were renounced, and when he got home, Locked it up in the fireproof safe. Hi, everybody. This is Paul Check. I come to give you a little message. I want to share some empathy. I know how hard it is to change your behavior when you got some bad diet and lifestyle habits and you look at that coffee or you look at the sugar or you look at the junk food that you're in love with and you reach for it because it's quick and easy and you keep telling yourself, I need to change, I need to change, I need to change. But eventually the system breaks down and you get motivated by the pain teacher. But what if I gave you an opportunity to try something that would help you start the process of behavior change and enjoy it and look forward to it? Well, I have something for you. It's Organifi's Red Juice. It tastes great and it's loaded with nutrition and lots of vitality for you. And I got Drew Canoli here to tell us why it works so well for behavior change and increasing your life force and your vitality. Drew, what's some, what's the magic in that red juice? Because everybody seems to love it. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Paul. Sometimes when we're craving things, mm. it's hard to switch a, a habit, yeah. a behavior. Yeah. So I looked at that fundamental fact and I'm like, well, what could we create that people could crave mm. that actually tasted great? Mm -hmm. And that's when red juice was born for Good. energy. So between the berries, the blueberries, the raspberries, mm. the strawberries, yes. the best quality organic glyphosate residue free, yes. the rhodiola and the cordyceps, yes. we were onto something. We sweetened Definitely. it with a dash of monk fruit mm. and literally I started to come to life. When I drank this, I had yeah. so much more energy than I would mm -hmm. normally have. Stamina went through the roof. Yeah. I actually shaved off 45 seconds off my mild time drinking red juice before I ran. Wow. Talk about an uptick in nitric oxide production in your body, right? <laughs> Something went up. Yeah. <laughs> we know speed Actually, <laughs> it's funny you say that because I get messages all the time about sexy time. Oh, and yeah? When people drink red juice. Something's like, going up. <laughs> Something's going up. And I got so many messages about that. That's funny you brought that up. Well, but, we hope it's the flag these days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so if you're looking for more energy and stamina and something that tastes great to where you could shift your cravings, yes. keeping your hunger and your energy in check. And feel good about it. And feel good about it. And you might even break down a little bit and wander back. But if you've got some natural sweetness and a lot of nutrition, you probably, if you're honest with yourself, won't need as many chips or as many mm -hmm. of whatever your little thing is, yeah. but you can do this naturally and easily. And that's what I'm all about, naturally and easily and honestly. And you know, it all starts with being honest with yourself. So if you want a great tasting behavioral switch technique that's really good for you, it has a lot of knock-on benefits for you and your whole family. Try Red Juice. Go to Organifi.com, O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com. And because I love you, Living 4D listeners, so much, I've organized for you to get a 20% discount with the code, capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20. And that's as fast as I can say that. I love you guys. Enjoy your Red Juice. There's a lot in there. Why do you th oh. why do you think he locked it up in a fireproof safe? Even because the guy had given up the millions. Because now it this had become the banker's most precious possession. Ah, yes, okay. <laughs> yes, it was his great lesson. 
Yes, because he, he had lost his millions. So now life had no meaning if all you think about is money. But now something gave his life meaning for by being exposed to a totally different perspective. Because if that guy who was in the lodge can have nothing and be happy, and suddenly he has more than uh, the prisoner has, so he too could be happy by understanding a spiritual aspect of life. So he kept that as a reminder. That is essentially their um, mutual enlightenment. Yes, that's very good. There, there's some of the things that rose in me from the story, which I think are you know kind of deep themes, is how we tend to live in our head um, when we feel that we have lost our freedom. You know, he he had committed himself to the 15 years, but he pretty much had to live in his head. He read hundreds of books. He had fantasies and stories and guests coming to visit him at night. He had, you know, been to the highs and, you know, so he, the, the, for me, a lot of what's happening is, is that when we, when we lose our freedom, then we resort to living in our head. And, you, you know, you have to ask yourself how many people in the world already feel as though they're imprisoned. <laughs> and and are are doing exactly that. They're just living in their head. It, it's in, quite incredible because this story is, I think, should 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 have been from the beginning of the twentieth century, and it is all the more relevant relevant for uh, today's society than it had been in that sense that you just mentioned back in the day. Yes, and the other one of the other key lines in there for me was the. It's the same flame in all of us, meaning, you know, the flame is often a metaphor for the soul or for spirit. And he, he was basically describing that it's the same flame for all of us. We're all we all are living these sort of paradigms and challenges. Uh, so it, it kind of makes the story more of a ubiquitous, like a something that for all of us. The other thing is he turned to the gospels after he was in there for a long time. And what are the gospels are stories about other people's pain and challenge and trials. So as the old saying goes, misery loves company. It also speaks tremendously to the challenges of morals and ethics and sticking to our agreements with ourselves and others. The guy, both of them ultimately for, for go, uh, for God, they, they didn't stick to their agreements. The guy in, that, that decided that it committed to the 15 years snuck out. So he broke his agreement and the guy that was going to pay him the 2 million wanted to kill him instead of paying him. So he was breaking his agreement. So paradoxically, both of them had a moral and ethical crisis, neither of which succeeded really. I mean, the guy did give up the 2 million, but he ultimately gave up on his own statement that he could do it and would do it. Now, I, I encourage listeners, however, to go back and, and re-listen to the story, because once you listen to it or read it a second time or a third time, you notice that the story actually gives you a lot of hints relevant to, to the time when you've already finished reading it. So for instance, um, there's one person saying in the beginning of the story, is it really possible to, to prove that... Uh, Either the death penalty or imprisonment for life are better by imprisoning somebody, and then later the uh, the banker sort of wonders, um, what what was that bet even about, and who won it, and you know, the, it it all became sort of irrelevant to them. However, in in my interpretation, it is it, it the story does prove a point. It actually changed my own opinion about the death penalty. I was uh, in support of the death penalty. I still think that in certain situations of um, of war, some types of wars which were uh, justifiably provoked, not uh, you know war wars we go to uh, for the sake of the interests of um, uh, oil companies and such, right? And politicians, yeah. But you know, if somebody is is really out there to try to kill you and your family. Um, or in terms of, again, situations of self-defense, then I'm, I'm not a pacifist. I mean, you could defend yourself and 
if push comes to shove, you might have to end up taking a life. But in if if somebody is already arrested or is a captive or whatnot, then you know I had a certain view of the death penalty, with which I I justified it for many years, in those sort of ways. And that story changed my mind because what it demonstrates is the reason that a life in prison is superior to the death penalty is that you can create, you could potentially create an enlightened life even in conditions of imprisonment. And that, of course, cannot be achieved if you are taken a life. And now, of course, that depends on the individual. Uh, and some, some would say, okay, so most people, they don't get all the one they want and they don't have a piano in their cell and don't get all the books they want and this and that. But one might consider and remember a, a person such as Nelson Mandela, whom on, it's true that after his imprisonment, he was also involved in a few things which are um, dubious and shady but nonetheless has achieved a certain type of enlightenment while being imprisoned in very harsh conditions. Yes. And, and thereafter, and whilst in, while in prison, and simply thereafter became a very prominent political leader, even though it was supposed to be, I think, uh, life in prison. Uh, and he did not have the piano and the books and the wine and all that. And people who have been, doing some reading and, and learning about imprisonment and prisons and such uh, would come across a lot of people uh, throughout history and also recent history, which have become more enlightened individuals while being in prison. But when we judge someone to be a certain thing and we want to kill them due to uh, certain actions, it is certainly justifiable, perhaps, that if someone has done horrendous things that we feel anger towards them. It's certainly justifiable, perhaps, under certain conditions that we keep them away from society if there's definitely no way to prevent them from continuing to hurt other people. Under that condition, there might be no choice. But it doesn't mean that they would be the same person a year or five years or certainly 15 years later. And imprisonment is not necessarily a punishment for the soul in the long term. Because depending on the individual, it can actually free the soul which I think the story clearly demonstrates. So um, who, there's the question of who won the bet. And I think the, the, law, the imprisoned lawyer won the bet. And then there is the question of, well, what is superior death penalty or life in prison? I think the answer for me would be a life in prison. And then the notion of the enlightenment itself attained by the prisoner being able to then enlighten more than just himself, but also at least one other person, which is also a very important message. Yeah. The other couple of things that I found important about the story was it really shows in some ways that at least in different stages of the story unfolding, that money was deemed more valuable than life. The guy mm -hmm. gave up 15 years of his life for $2 million, and the guy was willing to take a life to save his $2 million. So it, it, it's, it really points to the issues of the global elite today who think that money is more important than life because you know there's probably 150 of them that are billionaires that could easily make a huge impact on the quality of life for, in the world, especially for people that are struggling. Well, it's like that that meme on the internet that you know there are so and so billionaires around the world, but none of these suckers uh, care to be Batman. Right? Yeah, <laughs> none of them. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and then finally is you know the 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 Hindu concept of Maya, the grand illusion, and and really why I see Maya in there is because the the lawyer, while in in confinement, really. Not only was he in life, which is Maya, but he was engaging illusions in his mind that not only taught him something, but helped him deal with the solitary confinement. So you see that the concept of the illusion can work for you or against you. 
Hmm. Yes. Well, let's finish up with uh, Cook Ding's knife. Oh, yeah, that's uh, an, an old favorite of mine. Uh, one of the brilliant tales from the book of Zhuangzi, uh, and, which is a very difficult philosophical treatise, by the way. This is one of the easier stories from it. All right, so Cook Ding's Knife by Zhuangzi, translated by myself. Cook Ding was cutting up an ox for Lord Wenhui. Whenever he applied his hand, leaned forward with his shoulder, planted his foot, and employed the pressure of his knee in the audible ripping off of the skin and the slicing operation of the knife. The sounds were all in regular cadence. Movements and sounds proceeded as in the dance of the mulberry forest and the blended notes of King Shou. So essentially, uh, this is a beautiful uh, ancient Chinese language of saying that this cook, as he was cutting an ox, it was so marvelous that the sounds he was making were essentially like an orchestra. Uh, su su of such magnificence was his skill. So Lord Wenhui said, Ah, excellent. How have you been able to build and conceal such skill? Cook Ding relieved his knife and explained, I, your loyal subject, who is proper and good, is fond of the Tao also, the way, the way of the universe, the way of creation, that is the Tao, which I entered into by and from skill. So note here how he says that he is fond of the way of creation in the universe, the Tao, and he entered into it by and from skill. When I, your loyal subject, began dissecting oxen, I could only see the ox. After three years, I still could not see the wholeness of the ox. But nowadays, your loyal subject could, by means of his spirit, rather than by what his eyes can see, to know the limits of the organs of the body and to conduct his work in line with what the spirit desires. In light and because of the natural order of things, I ascertain and act with my knife on the big gaps, guide through the big hollows for the reason of them being the correct path. The skill passes through an agreement with the embroidered parts, the connective tissues, and with the large bones as well. A good cook changes his knife every year. It may have been broken. An ordinary cook changes his every month. It may have been snapped. At the present time, your loyal subject's knife is 19 years old, actually knowing thousands of oxen. Yet the blade seems as if newly sent from the whetstone. Those joints have definite spaces and room between them, and the knife's blade lacks thickness. By means of not having thickness, it can enter between. Vastly and extensively can the blade travel, suddenly having abundant leeway. Nevertheless, whenever I come to a complicated joint, and see, there will be some difficulty. I proceed anxiously and with caution, not allowing my eyes to wander from the place and moving my hand slowly, setting the knife into motion with a very small touch. There is already correct division and the sound of flesh separating from the bone, like clay cast onto the ground. Standing up with the knife in my hand, I look all around with great pride in my work and store my, wife, my knife away. Lord Wenhui said, Excellent. I hear Cook Ding's words and obtain knowledge on how to cultivate life. Yeah, it's, it's a great story. Um, 
the, the couple of things that come to me, it, it goes back to our previous podcast where one of your three recommendations was Gong Fu, because you, if you don't learn to do anything well, one thing well, you won't learn to do anything well. And he clearly mastered his craft. Um, you know, the other thing is, is that when you reach a level of mastery where you don't have to consciously think, you're able to actually enter into the flow of it. And that's the spirit coming in. There's the, the unconscious competency emerges. And so now you're past the technical challenges of the skill and you're into the artistry of it. And that's where you go from it being butchering to being something that is not only an expression of his mastery, his artist as a butcher, his artistry, but takes him into the Tao because really, what is he describing? Going through the middle of the joints and finding the passageways. And, and so if you, if you, take that ox and, and put the word life in there. And then you take the word knife and replace it with mind. And you take the Tao and say, okay, life is something we have to initially cut our way through to find our way through the passages, the tight spaces in life. But that ultimately it becomes easy when we become evolved enough and skilled enough to no longer have to do it with our mind, but to follow the flow of the Tao. And then ultimately, even the emperor or the, the, the it was the emperor, wasn't it? That was so A, a lord, a, a few of the lord. Yes. It, it's interesting uh, where he, he says um, that he can then do what the spirit desires. And a spirit, in, in he probably used, the, if I remember correctly, the Chinese character, the word Shen. And it is as ambiguous as it is in the English language. So it can actually be um, your own, a, a section of your own soul. And it can be a spirit as in a spirit guide. It could also be spirit as in God, in the universe. So he intentionally don't tell you what spirit. But I, fo I, I, I achieved Gong Fu, which is skill acquired, a, a high level of skill acquired for continuous practice. Now, then I achieved mastery. And by focusing with my mastery, the spirit can gain influence. And now it's not the hand, even though it's the technically it's the physical motions, but what the heart desires, or or uh, otherwise what the greater consciousness desires, expresses itself directly in the movement. And this uh, actually corresponds what what he's talking about with several verses in the Tao Te Ching. Um, as a lot of stories in Zhuangzi, the Tao Te Ching might be called the first book of the Tao, and and which slightly predates Zhuangzi. By the way, um, note how just a side note here, he's speaking about flow, which is a concept that has be, had become uh, quite popular, especially in in sports over the past few decades in uh, in Western culture. But he's he's speaking of that same concept, you know, twenty five hundred years ago or so. We've had it since we've been humans, right? <laughs> yeah, we, we haven't evolved that much. We just now have uh, electrical gadgets to help us get to where we could have gotten to with focusing on gong fu. <laughs> so, so he's talking about uh, it, two places where I see him corresponding with the Tao Te Ching is one, the knife lacks thickness, has very little thickness. So where I apply the, the knife's relative lack of thickness to large gaps, then I can gain an advantage. That corresponds with a verse in the Tao Te Ching that talks about uh, where you've got doors and windows, and what's the advantage or what's the use in the doors and windows? The use and the advantage is in the holes. In the emptiness. In the, space, in the emptiness between, exactly. So he's talking exactly about it, it, that emptiness. And... In another way, he's also saying, you know, I apply myself to the way of least resistance. Yes. And this is why the knife does not get ruined. Because I, I apply the lack of the relative lack of thickness to the big gaps. 
and I and I go by the path of least resistance. And the historical context is important because you know now nowadays we can manufacture like really high grade knives in factories, or even the handmade ones. You know, being worked on for hundreds or thousands of hours, knives and swords can be of very high quality. We're talking twenty five hundred years ago. Um, it was very difficult to keep your knife sharp and functioning and and ensure that you know that the edge does not split etc you you need to have a very high level of skill yeah great story well i'll close up by saying thank you jonathan and uh thank you to our sponsors for all the great products you create and your sustainable values and being a great example to other companies big and small Thank you to all of you. I hope you enjoyed the teaching stories today and the insights that uh, we were able to draw from them. And hopefully you too, maybe you got some insights completely different than what Jonathan and I shared, which that would be cool. And uh, I look forward to sharing more with you next time. Uh, It's a fascinating time in the world right now. And uh, I think we're all uh, learning a lot and growing a lot. And One of the things today reminded me of is the fact that no matter how far back you go back in history, you'll see human beings working through the same struggles and learning the same lessons that we are. So uh, there's a lesson there. And I think a time to sit around the metaphorical campfire and listen to a great storyteller is a chance for us to become conscious as to what people have learned in the past what their mistakes were, and how we can actually take those lessons into our life so that we don't have to go through 15 years of imprisonment to find freedom or (laughs) how we can learn from the cook and his mastery and those types of things. So uh, thanks again, Jonathan. What a a great chance to really uh, look carefully into ourselves. Thank you very, very much, Paul, for the opportunity to share with everyone those very important stories about uh, humanity. And indeed, if you're listening to this podcast uh, past the year 2024, then by then I would have likely published a a book called Exceptional Stories About Humanity. Good. And and these stories would be contained therein, the book Exceptional Stories About Humanity. Again, if you would like to look into my work, or uh, perhaps study martial arts for me uh, and my organization, you can uh, find us on bluejadesociety.com, write my name on Amazon affiliated website like amazon.com, or uh, look up my name, Jonathan Bluestein, on YouTube. Yes, and it's spelled B L U E S T E I N, Jonathan? B L U B L U E S T I N, indeed. Yeah, Bluestein. Excellent. All right, guys, thank you for another great podcast together. Thank you, Jonathan. Stay in touch and let's see what we can get out of Jonathan next. He's into lots of things and he's got a deep mind as you found out today. So lots of love, everyone. See you next time. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Shifu Jonathan Bluestein. You can connect with Jonathan via his website, bluejadesociety.com, or on Facebook at Bluestein. You can find Paul on Instagram and TikTok at paul.check, on Twitter at paulcheck, or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4 d with Paul Check. You can also watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com or visit the Czech Institute site at checkinstitute.com to find Paul's e-learning courses, advanced training programs, and to learn more about the Czech Academy. You can read the show notes and find links to the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast.